I'm Tammy Vendonger, host for Executive with a Cause. Today on the show, I welcome Annalisa Kiros Wolf. She's the former CEO of the Neighborhood Charter Schools in New York, and today she leads women's leadership programs in a podcast called Women of Color Rise. Today, we're going to chat about the good, bad, and hard things about running both not for profits and social enterprises. Annalisa, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tammy. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, me too. We've, we've known each other for probably over 20 years, don't you think? Definitely. My days at Stanford, you were someone I looked up to way back in the day. <laughs> well, I mean, we were both young um, Air Force officers in the U.S. Air Force, and our unusual climb up the ladder has kind of had some parallels in the fact that we both had um, gone down a corporate pathway and then at some point kind of moved into a not-for-profit space here and there, but it wasn't like consistently done. It was just, uh, it was a very strange way to get to the CEO level. So um, I, I find, you know, 20 years later, how interesting it is that both of us took these very odd paths. And both of us have podcasts, which is so cool. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, it's great that we're still in touch. And Annalisa, I know you spent a lot of your career after the Air Force in the chartered school systems. For those of us that are in Australia and, and, and elsewhere, a lot of people will not be familiar with those kind of programs. Could you tell us a little bit more about them? So we're both from the business world. And the idea of charter schools was the idea of having innovative ways of doing old school models, some including some business principles, and introducing that into the district world. So to be clear, charter schools are public schools funded by the public dollar, by the city, state, and national government. So it's a public school. Anybody can attend. That said, with the disruption, the idea was that let's bring in new ideas, new people. And perhaps if we have a, an environment where there's more competition, so business principle, then families will be able to select a school that's best for them. So they still have your traditional district school and they also have some charter schools. So it's to introduce ideas, entrepreneurial activity, it brought in a ton of funding. So it seemed like a good way to resuscitate an industry that doesn't have a lot of in in innovation and also bring in new funding. From that perspective, why would someone choose to go to a normal public school if they can go to a charter school? It sounds like the charter school has a lot of advantages. Well, at the end of the day, as a parent, you want the best school for your kid. And sometimes that school is a, your traditional public school down the street that's been there for a century or 50 years. And then sometimes it's not good enough for your kid and you want a more specialized school, maybe higher academics or a music school or some other idea. So whatever the idea of your child is and what you want, then you can find that niche for your kid. So it doesn't matter whether it's traditional or charter, you just want the best school for your kid. I think just from trying to have some parallels, a lot of people here in Australia would be thinking about a charter school being maybe offering some of the services that a private school might provide. Is, is there anything specific about the charter school system that um, I guess I'm still trying to get my head around what's unique about a charter school. So there's some business principles in there. There's some innovation. But what would it be? How would it be different than if you sent your kid to a public school? Okay, given that anyone can start a school as long as it's approved by your local government or your governing agency, there's different qualities of school. You might have a mom and pop school. So you and I could say hey, let's start a school oh, and wow. we can get the approvals and do it. Okay. And then you might have another network. And so they might be more funded or have some solidified curriculum, solidified models. And so depending on where, and it's not to say you and I couldn't build a great school, right? It just depends on the leadership, the infrastructure, the curriculum, how well the community's bought in. All those then depend, then lead to, is the, in this case, not a business, is this going to thrive? So it, the quality is all over the place. So while a charter school is a public school, the quality can span from not great to great. And when it's not great in a charter school, the accountability is very high. So after a few years, if they don't meet benchmarks, they are going to be shut down. 
that's a definitive process. In the case of a traditional public school, those don't have a shutdown process in general. It's very hard to shut down. There's a teacher's union. Charter schools have more flexibility. And so the, the differences between the two, charter schools have more flexibility. They tend to not have teacher's unions. So you're more likely to have a flexible workforce. They tend to have longer school days. A lot tend to work, although the workload is quite high sometimes in charter schools, but that doesn't guarantee quality. Yeah. So, you know, there's been a lot of conversation in, in all career fields really about the great resignation. When you when you talk about how um, teachers in particular are already known to work quite hard, why would they choose to, to work in a charter school? The thing about schools is that it's a war for talent. It's always a war for talent, but particularly in schools when the salary is very low and there's a ton of options for you and there's not a lot of brand. So all of that, then if you get people interested in this profession, they don't even know where to go. So they happen to land at the school and they're usually not that prepared. They're pretty terrible their first two years. It's very normal to be terrible. When they start to get good, they're so burnt out that they leave. Mm -hmm. That's generally the life cycle of a teacher. And so it's not surprising then that when you have a very low tenured staff and you are just trying to fight fires in your school, that then it impacts the kids and the kids are not learning because they constantly have new teachers practicing on them. So the way to do this model instead is to have a value proposition. And so you and I are both marketers but also talent leaders, an employee value proposition that promises teachers that you'll have the best professional development, you'll find pride in the organization that you're part of, you'll have a community that's supporting you that feels tight from the very get-go, that you'll see the impact on your students. So this type of employee value proposition that goes along with hopefully some work-life balance that's been a, a new thing these mm -hmm. past years mm -hmm. of trying to keep people in with such a bad reputation, Plus the entrepreneurial part, because people often with charters, it's beautiful to have all of these scripted lesson plans and all of the, the business plans, right, to how to have run a classroom. But it takes away the agency of teachers to actually be creative and be their own maestro in this concert of kids. And so this way we're saying, you know, you are still the master of your classroom. We're gonna give you resources and allow you to do your thing. And so that kind of employee value proposition is what we tried to do in bringing people in. We layered on top of it. So that could be vanilla for a lot of charter schools. We layered on top of it an anti-racist organization. That's why I joined and not all organizations are like that, unfortunately, but for us, we, we layered that into it. Social justice, what we believe about students and what they should know about how things are run here in the United States. And with that, we got people who bought into all of it. Yeah. And that's what allowed us, I think, to differentiate and have people tenured for five, eight years, which is very, very long in education. I'd say that kind of employee value proposition where it's clear where the work, the hopefully some sort of sustainability, and then the promise of having a differentiating factor like anti-racist mm -hmm. helps to bring people in and keep them longer. You mentioned marketing at the, at the very beginning of that value proposition. How do you make sure that it's not just marketing? Like, like what are the, the things you had to put underneath it to ensure that it actually was executed? So with marketing, you have a brand and that brand hopefully is holistic so that whatever you're presenting externally, it's consistent. If you're an anti-racist organization, it's part of your core values. It's part of your mission statement. It's part of your board presentations, your training. So when you go to the website, it should feel like, yes, that makes sense because I'm reading and I'm listening to videos and they all are consistent. So that's the first part. The yeah. second part is it's not enough to have the things on the website. You have to also have staff who say that too, because you can do things like glass door and hear this anti-racist thing isn't true. It's all of not true. So instead have staff who actually believe in it and can then be your ambassadors. So having staff, and so you have to take hopefully an anti-racist, in our case, strategy and then start to deploy it to have staff believe it. Yeah. So that's the second part. And the third that part I would say is your best recruiters are your people. 
So we always leveraged our people because then they knew others who were in the same circles or also believed in similar things. They would bring people on. They were the ones who said, this is the place. There aren't any other organizations like it. Come join this family. And so those three things, I think, then take this concept and actually bring it to, to life. Yeah. Look, it makes a lot of sense. I think operationalizing any strategic goals and mission in itself is difficult. Like you talked about working from the people and then having them recruit people that are similar to them. Are there other operating procedures or, um, I suppose, um, you know, policies and processes that support that as well? Absolutely. Another piece that's important to, in my case, I really believe in diversity, equity, inclusion. We have to have systems that are about equity, which includes pay. And we need to stop with this whole, I want to negotiate around the back. I will come if you give me an extra bonus that you won't give anyone else. Why don't you increase my pay because I'm about to leave. And so all of these things that frankly white people, men tend to champion for, women, people of color are less likely to do just based on research. We take those off the table. Here's the salary scale, just like the military. Here's the salary scale based on your number of years and your education. And maybe you have a few others like language or you're teaching a hard, a tough, tough subject. That's going to determine where you are. And then we're going to have a performance management system that's as sometimes you might have complicated ones like a teacher evaluation that includes some metrics and that's very complex. Or you might just have your manager and some observations. Mm. So whatever that system is, being really clear on it and then saying, and here's what we're doing. For us, we were lucky to have enough a bonus and it used to be where people, the CEO would give bonuses to people who are more close to him or it didn't, it wasn't very clear how it was done. For me, it's not to say it's better, but what I decided to do was have everyone have the same bonus. And that's what we would do during the pandemic. And maybe for other future years, you would have ways of calibrating who should get what. So just some sort of system to equalize it and then also tell your recruits, here's how it's done. So that you're, unfortunately people talk about what they, unfortunately, mm -hmm. unfortunately they talk about their salaries. So if they're gonna do that, at least you can say, I got the same thing, or I got based on what the system said, we're all transparent. I'm not happy about it, but at least I understand how it works. Yeah. You know, it's funny when you talk about equity, I, I think not everyone first starts with just getting paid the same. It's it's something that's so obvious. Like I, I noticed um, when I joined an organization and I looked at the pay salaries across all the managers that the men were making more than the women <laughs> and, and the women were generally in charge of more people. And I didn't understand that. So I that one of the first things I did was just completely made it even. Um, but I'm not sure that everybody thinks about equity just starting with the paycheck. And it's, it's you know, it's, it is a pretty core operational requirement. It's interesting to me and probably to others that you can just have an idea that you want your children or, or just children in general to have a different kind of education. You could just start something and then get government funding from that. What, what would it take to, um, you know, I'm thinking about like infrastructure. Like how do you secure a building? How do you secure teachers, um, like what's the process of starting these types of programs? Because it doesn't sound easy at all. I mean, that's the issue I think that many charters face is that while you and I might have all the optimism and these MBAs and say like, we can do it. The reality is there's so much work to do and there's not a ton of systems that you would just lift off. So schools in general in the United States operate in pockets and there's not it's very hard to coordinate and say, okay, I've, I've done this heavy lifting. Let me share it with you. Best practices are hard to share in general. So charter schools, it's even more amplified. The systems taken are, and they're all running at the same time. You and I get this approval. Hooray. We immediately, and we to get the approval, we have to have some academic plan in place, a general school year, a board. So we have some strategy and some concepts and a ton of maybe a hundred pages of paper that we submitted. But to actually execute it, find the team of people that can actually bring this vision to life, find a facility. So in the days of the old days, you actually had to find like a private facility, or if you got lucky, the government would give you a facility that you could have some money to renovate. And then you'd have to get community buy-in, start recruiting students. In my case, I didn't even have a building or any, any staff hired. So I was like, we're going to be starting the school. 
it's going to be great. Here's the concept on paper. I really believe in it. Come and bring your kids. And it starts in six months. I mean, it was just crazy how you're doing all of that. And you're getting kids to come in because if you don't even meet the number of kids to have in your first year, you're not financially sustainable. So it's, it's really hard. And I, even the most hardworking of people, it's a struggle. Yeah. Is, is the funding, is the funding based on the number of students? Yes. Okay. Per people funding. Exactly. Are the schools that are being set up as charters, are they, do they tend to be in more lower social economic areas? In general, yes. Yeah. The idea is that, I mean, I was a low income kid and I had to go to a school an hour away. Really wish that there had been a top quality school in my neighborhood. So that's the idea. Bring charter schools closer to the people who really need them. Got it. Okay. And before we came on the air, we were actually talking about some of the challenges of doing that, of coming into a, a community that you might be an outsider and trying to do something good there. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you've had in terms of trying to set up a school for the benefit of their community, but once again, being that person who may not look like them, may not live there? Um, can you talk about those challenges? Sure. So I'm Asian American and my parents immigrated from the Philippines. We grew up in a low-income neighborhood in San Diego. And that is the reason why I really believe in having great schools because I didn't have great schools in my neighborhood. And so with that, I started schools where I live now, which is in New York City. And I wanted to bring these schools to neighborhoods like mine. But when I got there, a dominant race was Black. And I'm talking to them and saying, come join the school. I look nothing like them. I'm not from the neighborhood. So a lot of people were questioning, who are you? And why are you talking about replacing the school? Because that school's this, that's my neighbor. I've known her for 30, 40 years. Who do you think you are? And people were angry. I mean, we had a community meeting where hundreds of people from the community showed up and were cursing and spitting. I mean, I could understand that. Could Imagine someone coming to your house. I'm showing up at your house, have no idea who you are, don't look anything like you and, and say, I've got a better option and goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> so at the time, it was really sad and upsetting for me, but now as a parent, it makes sense to me why people were upset because we didn't do it with as much, I think, respect and collaboration as was required. Yeah. What, what would you do differently if you were starting a school based on that experience? At the time for my school, we were started with the intention to replace a failing school, a failing school with the principal who had been there for 35 years, well-loved in the community. I mean, we were set up to be absolutely like the enemy of this community. And so I should have known the context. One, I should have known the history. I ended up doing it later, but there are books about this community. What's happened to them? Who is this woman? What is the school about? Because when they came to the community meeting and they talked about her, they didn't care that the school had terrible grades and students weren't learning the way that they should. What was more important was that they were about each other. They were taking care of each other. That was completely missed on me. I showed up with, here are our test scores. Here's our results. I'm going to replicate this model. It's going to be great. Why wouldn't you say yes to this amazing model? I completely missed that this is a community who were loyal to the very, very end. So understanding the history, having real understanding of what the school means to the community. So that was the first thing that I would do mm. if I were to go back. The second thing I would do differently is I would partner with that principal. It was set up so that we would take over. I would have actually talked to the government and said, listen, they are where they are. Perhaps there's a way we could work together in partnership so that they can also continue. And then we can also provide another option in partnership. And so understand what they provide really well you are a wonderful social emotional school. We were not, right? We were a school that was about high rigor and extra reading and extra math. And we had it set up where students, after they go to the bathroom, they would have anti-back. I mean, I'm thinking about it as my parent, like, why would I want that? But that was our school. It was crazy and amazing, but also crazy. But we would have found differentiating points that we were both proud of and then actually shared that together. I think recruitment could have been done together 
here's my school, here's their school, they're amazing. If you want that option, please go ahead. So that kind of collaboration. And the third thing I would say is we should have culture build together. Our mm -hmm. staff, their staff, we finally got to it. But for Thanksgiving, we had like a potluck and we invited them to be the judges. I mean, that's great. People don't, you know, refuse great food. But we should have done that from the very get-go during our staff orientation, had some real bonding with their staff so that when our staff passed other staff, I mean, it was as if there was going to be a fight. Mm. Look at them. They think they're better. Our staff also skewed white. Their staff was more people of color from the community. So there should have been real relationships, real investment in all of that before it all started. So those three things I would do differently. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, look, it's, it's great to hear that you had some learnings from there. And I certainly think that in the not-for-profit space, there's there's a lot of charities in particular that are very similar. They're providing very similar services. And I, I was talking to um, one of our guests, Carrie Leeson, at the very beginning of the, of the, when we started um, cutting these podcasts. And she said collaboration has actually hurt their funding, that you can't easily collaborate with other charities because sometimes it actually impacts your funding model, especially from government. So it's really interesting that you're, you're um, in a similar situation where the – both schools would be funded by government. One's not doing as well as the other academically, but it is socially. And as you say, what you were doing was trying to bring in academic rigor and how if you could have taken the two, take the heart, take the head, bring it together, how you might have had better outcomes with the community and buy-in. So great, great lesson learned there. And since the, you've done a lot of work in the charter school system, you've moved, be, you've moved beyond that now. And I know you're doing a lot of work with um, – women leadership and empowerment and especially women of color and you've written a number of books can you talk a little bit more about your work today so I focused most of my career on k-12 and what i've realized as a senior leader and eventually ceo of a charter network is that there's a reason why there aren't very many of us there's a reason why there are very leaders of color women leaders of color and especially mom leaders of color being a CEO, as you know, Tammy, is incredibly hard, but at the top levels, there's additional issues and discrimination that we face. I found myself as amazingly talented as the staff were that I led. I questioned whether they would talk to me or say things that they would say to a, a white male and would happen on a daily basis. So the journey was hard and lonely. I was incredibly grateful to have the opportunity and proud of the impact I had, but I had wished I had more support, which is how I'm now pivoting my career is in this next chapter, who do I want to support? And it's really leaders of color, women, women leaders, and how do we have a place of support, safety, community, knowing that we're not alone, that we can be in these seats and thrive, but we can't do it alone. So that's the whole pivot reason. It, it's interesting that, that you're moving back into this empowerment of women, and especially of color, because I know that 20 years ago, you had a not-for-profit that you started and are co-founded co called Island Girl Power in Guam. I can't help but think that that was either a seed for your current work or it's evidence that you've always been interested in this. What do you reckon? Is, is this, um, was that the, the start of something that is now just starting to realize? You know, I think the seed was there and also throughout my life, meeting people like you and others who have paved the path to say, you know, you can use your talent to helping people sometimes in our similar situations. So Island Girl Power was this opportunity when I was stationed in Guam in the Air Force to help teens with not looking at suicide as their only way out. And it was a version of, I say, Girl Scouts, a place where you could get some skills, meet community, feel pride in yourself. And I think with that same concept, it's I guess it's like what we're trying to do today, which is there's other ways of doing things that don't have to feel so guilt-driven or 
depress, have a depression, especially during times of pandemic, your, your community, your professional development, your lessons learned, those are all also available. We just have to raise them up. So I suppose they're similar, which I never thought of before. So I love that you mentioned that. It, it just shows, I think, this ongoing interest in, especially women of color. And I can't help but think that, um, you know, the girls that have benefited from you 20 years ago are now women that are probably and hopefully in leadership roles and mother roles and things like that. The, the kind of community that you're trying to create now with your, your existing work, um, can you tell us more about what you plan to do and what you're currently doing in that space? So what I was doing in that space was a program called Boss Mamas, which was about women who, were, who are also moms. Most of them were moms. And how do we both lead at work and also lead in our lives as mothers, as partners, just or just people? How do we also take care of ourselves? And that program has been so rewarding to meet women of different walks of life throughout the country. Also, I'd say I'm taking this more into focusing on how do you actually grow leadership so that you can grow to the top and stay at the top. So it's a bit different and it's, it's less, it's holistic still, but less focused on being a mom and more focused on what are those, those soft skills, those inner confidence that you need when you are leading people. In the military, as we both know, you're put in these really tough situations and how do you react under new conditions, not knowing what to do, new people having to project confidence. And so how do we talk about that as women, as women of color? What are some lessons learned? And how do you keep on rising and, and stop? Sometimes it's ourselves that holds ourselves back. There's Yes, there's discrimination, but also our own confidence and beliefs that limit us. And so naming both sides to help elevate, because I do believe that once we have different types of leaders at the table, diverse leaders, that's actually how we change systems because we're led differently, perhaps more inclusively, more collaboratively. And I think that's when the rest of the system changes, when you change leadership. Now, this is more of a social enterprise for you, and it's it's fairly new. Do you have, um, I guess, an idea of how the funding model is going to be working in the future or how it's working right now? I think it's a mix some individual coaching, some co consulting. And then I think that by doing some of these books, I mean, it's not the most lucrative thing to be an author, but there's some sort of streams that come in that way. Mm. But I'm frankly more driven. I know that we should always be driven by all the factors, including financial. But in this next chapter, I really am driven by how can I be of service in ways that I think are unique to my experiences? Because I don't think that as a white man, you can do the same work. I have unique experiences to bring and how do I do that? And then the funding model will show up. And so it's much more of a surrender model versus like, here's my business plan, I'm gonna execute. And then by Q1, 2023, here's what I'm gonna deliver. It's much more loose, but I think it's okay given where I am in my stage of life. Yeah. I mean, let, let's talk about a couple of those books because um, they're really inspiring. <laughs> you have, in fact, it's part of the name, Asian Americans Who Inspire Us, Native Americans Who Inspire Us. Um, you've done a number of books in that space and they're children's books, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, so they're, the very first book that I published was Balak Bayan. So that was about my time in the Philippines where I lived in my father's house for six months trying to live as close as I could to what it was like when he was growing up. So cold baths with a bucket, a no air conditioning, a rooster waking me up in the morning, taking the, the jeepney, which you know is this army truck, you know, to school. So that book came of that experience. What did I learn reflecting on who I am and how my connection to the Philippines is actually much deeper than I thought. So that book came and then this first children's book came because as a mother, I was looking for books with kids with that my kids could look up to role models who look like them. And to back in 2018, amazingly enough, there weren't that many. So I ended up raising my hand and saying, let's try to do this. And that's how Asian American who inspire us came. And I worked on that with my son and also Michael Franco. And then from there, 
my husband and I worked on Native Americans Who Inspire Us, which just launched uh, about a month ago. And then we're working on the next one. So it's it's such a fun enterprise. I mean, it's I'm honestly like the financial model is not that strong on these books, but to me, it's about this experience that I get to create with my son. And then it seems to have been resonating with other people as well. I, I've been really amazed at how they're at like different bookstores, different libraries and schools across the country. And so it's helping students see that they too can be whoever they want to be in life because there are people who look like them in books. And I think I've read them myself and I think they're both, um, at least I read two of them. I, I think they're, they're good for adults too. Like I grew up near an Apache reservation and there were things I didn't know. So I was just like, wow, I didn't realize that that person was, had done these things. So that, that's pretty amazing. Um, how can people find these books if they're interested in, in you know, um, purchasing them or at least reading them? Where, where can they go to find those? In the United States, I'm not sure if in Australia, but we go to Amazon for a lot of our books, but there's also Barnes and Noble and it's carried in some of our libraries here, but Amazon is the place I usually direct people. Okay. I think we can get it off of um, the Kindle version and you probably could, we could probably import it into Australia. And as far as the rest of your work, um, what could our listeners do to support that? Well, I'd love if people could listen also to the podcast that I do, which is called Women of Color Rise. And really it's trying to find resources to support diverse leaders. So I happen to be in the United States, but how can you help support each other, particularly people sometimes who don't have the connections or maybe even confidence to raise their hand, climb up, reach those most senior levels. So that's how I would say to support the work is, is find people who are diverse and particularly people of color, support them. And if I can be helpful, let me know. Okay, great. And how can we reach out to you if they want to contact you directly? I'm at AnnaliseWolf.com. Make sure we'll put it in the show notes. Annalisa, thank you for your time today. I think there's a lot of lessons learned in that. You've had such a range of experiences from charter schools and military, I, I, you know, corporate to not for, not for profits and even your social enterprise right now. I think it's brilliant to see how a career can evolve the way it has, but it, still with such strong values about trying to help people and specifically um, those with minority um, ethnic groups in particular. It, it's something to aspire to, to just know you can have a career that's so diverse and yet still continue to, to follow your own personal values and mission. Thanks, Tammy. Hi, this is Tammy again. When I'm not doing podcasts, I'm helping not-for-profits with IT decisions. The question for this week's IT in Plain English segment is, when should you use an RFT process to procure IT equipment or services? First of all, what is an RFT? It stands for Request for Tender. You might also hear about different versions of these, such as a Request for Quote or an RFQ, a Request for Proposals, an RFP. Regardless of what it's called, it's basically a document that tells vendors or service providers what your requirements are so that they can submit a proposal. The RFT process is very popular in large organizations when they're buying IT services or products, and many not-for-profits use them too. I used to be someone who used to write these RFTs for a living, and I've also been a vendor who's responded to them. And I could tell you from all those experiences that I'm not a fan of the RFT process for not-for-profits. They're incredibly time-consuming and costly to write, and it takes forever before the organization has indicative prices to know if they could even afford the solution. So when should you use an RFT process for your IT purchases? I personally recommend only using them for commodity services and equipment that can be easily compared to each other, something like computers or leases on a printer. Anything else that involves some level of configuration or customization can be better procured through a different process that allows you to get to know the how much will it cost question sooner. If you want more information about these alternative processes, just let me know. In the meantime, there you have it in plain English. If you have an IT question you want answered, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a message. I just might answer it on the show. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe and leave me a review. To all of you executives with the cause, the world is definitely a better place because of you. Thank you for what you and your teams do every day.